Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, which stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Ms. Redak, can we do a roll call, please? Mr. J? Yeah. Mrs. Ribeiro? Yeah. Mrs. Oliveira? Yeah. Mr. Ergen? Yeah. Mr. Toomey? Yeah. Mr. Marlin? Uh, yeah. After the She's here. <laughs> <laughs> I distracted her. Yes, go for it. Um, anyone who wishes to record or photograph the meeting must first notify the chair, who will then inform the public per order of the Massachusetts Open Meeting Law, July 210. Um, uh, such audio or video recording may not interfere with this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Mollett. So late this afternoon, I received a call um, from legal counsel. So I need to amend uh, the executive se session item under Chapter 30, Section 21 to add a second item uh, to discuss strategy regarding ongoing litigation. The matter would have a detrimental effect on the litigation position of a public body if we were to do it in open session. So we're adding uh, a second item to discuss Lit strategy regarding to ongoing litigation and executive session pursuant to 940 CMR 29.03, which allows the public body to amend such notice in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Unforeseen circumstances. Thank you, Dr. Mauer. Um, Ms. Verdett, we have no public comment. Um, Mr. Ergen? Yes. Mr. Okay. Um, meeting and acceptance of the minutes of December 13th, please. Make a motion to accept. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Um, auditor's report. Um, Mr. Lima, mm -hmm. take the platform, please. Everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Andrew Lima. I was the manager on your engagement this year. Uh, I've been with the firm for about 15 years. And tonight I'm going to um, go through your financial statement and your single audit report. Um, as the case has been in the past, uh, the materials were very well prepared from the business office. Um, our staff didn't have um, any audit adjustments to post to the ledger. Um, so I think the information that's um, being periodically given to you is, is likely very accurate and reliable. Um, we'll start with the annual financial statement report. Uh, page, pages one through three, we the auditor's opinion. Uh, it's a very similar letter to last year. There were some um, structural changes made by the AFTPA, so you're going to notice that our opinion now is right up in the front. Um, and this is what we would refer to as a unmodified or clean opinion. Um, uh, behind this is in line with U.S. GAAP. Uh, jumping ahead to pages 5 through 13. 5 through 13 is uh, management discussion and analysis. The second is required by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board and that's the format for these financials. And the um, uh, first page of that section on page 5, we've got some financial highlights there. Um, I just want to highlight the increase for now in uh, Chapter 70 School Aid and also um, for the governmental fund, the uh, general fund, the fund equity had increased about uh, 1.1 million for the year. Um, 45 to 46 is the budget actual phase uh, of that. to that. Um, I guess you can something uh, to be interested in. Um, as you can see in the top section, uh, uh, regional transportation aid was one of the positive turnbacks there, uh, 483,000 more than expected. Um, and overall, the excess of revenue and expenditures for the year was 619,689. So you were within um, the budget that was established. Page nine. I'm going back into the MDNA. 
Page nine will be a summary of the uh, total net position on the government-wide basis. So um, what that's referring to is when we uh, draft these statements basis of accounting, we have the full accrual basis, which includes all your long-term asset and liabilities, and you have the modified accrual basis, which is your, your short-term focus without those long-term assets. So um, examples of long-term assets would be your, your capital items, your building, your land, and equipment used at the school. Long-term liabilities would be um, your pension expense, or at least your proportionate share of the New Bedford. Uh, also, your OPEB liability and any debt that you carry. Uh, on that basis of accounting, uh, the net position decreased 3.2 million, but um, that was uh, largely in part to depreciation that exceeded the new capital assets that were capitalized of about 937,000. Um, and also oh, <clears throat> increases to the district share of the pension expense. And overall, the net OPEB liability, um, that also changed quite a bit throughout the year. Um, when it was net with the deferred inflow and outflow, the liability had decreased. Um, and that was primarily due to the discount rate. So as the rates rise, that liability that you are for will fall. Um, that has not been the case for quite a while as the rates were continuously falling. Um, so this year we've seen through not only your statement, but others, um, any unfunded plan where it's tied to the AA bond rating is going up and the liability is coming down. Um, it looks like that trend will continue into fiscal 23. It's 17. 17 through 20. Uh, this is a, what's referred to as the modified accrual um, statement. And this is your short-term focus. Um, I spoke with uh, Pam this morning, in fact, uh, Excess and deficiency still hasn't been certified, even though the paperwork's been submitted. So uh, I did want to talk about what that number was, but that hasn't been certified by the state yet. It's 19. You can see, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the general fund with the million dollar increase in that position for the year, and that ties back to your budget to actual. So that's what those things are derived. Page 22, we have 2022 20, rather. Uh, this is your fiduciary statement in that position. A number of years ago, you had opened the OPEP Trust Fund. Uh, that's something that we kind of talk about every year. Uh, that's to fund the only portion of the healthcare, retiree healthcare estimate. Um, this year, you contributed 50,000. I think last year I talked about the projections that were in the actual actuarial report itself, which is conducted uh, based on an independent study. The actuary presented a table that I believe worked out to be somewhere between three and four percent of your budget. Um, I recommend that you at least start with one percent of your budget uh, to drop into the OPEP trust each year. Um, it's not required to be funded, but you know, the long-term growth over time might uh, be worthwhile. Um, the OPEB note itself is note number seven, and that begins on page 35. So if you were interested in reading up on the details of the OPEB plan, this is on page 35 and on page 36. Uh, you can see that the Changes in assumptions at 27.7 million, that estimate, in part to, due to the rising rates and the discount rate being tied to those rates, was the key factor in reducing the liability for this year. So this is a requirement of the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. It's required in any financial statement that you'll see where um, an entity has retiree health care. And again, it's independent study that's conducted. There is a separate report that we use to draft this note. I'm going to skip ahead to page uh, 45. So 45 stocks the um, required supplementary information. So this is what is set as required for each statement by the Government Accounting Standards Board. We already talked about uh, the budget to actual being in that section. And if you continue through that section, you also have 
um, details on their proportionate share of the net pension liability we're building for the 10 year schedule as required by Gatsby 68. 68, I should say. And on pages 55 to 56, you have uh, the same type of information about respect to OPEB. And that is also building towards the 10 year schedule. There are a few left years there. Uh, that standard came into play a couple of years after the pension uh, standard. And towards the back, we've got some info on the revolving funds in federal and state and your other special revenue funds as supplementary, um, which management has chosen to present in this report. Uh, that concludes the financial statement portion. I have the single audit to go through as well, but if there are any questions, I'll take them. Yes. Any idea when the E and D would be certified? I submitted it by the deadline of October 30th, and I have not heard back from our liaison at Department of Revenue as far as where I am on her schedule. So I have not heard of it yet. I know that they were behind last year, and we did not get certified until March last year. So I'm going to anticipate around the same time frame again. So just so the committee is aware, um, Pam and I obviously have regular conversations regarding excess and efficiency accounts, and the plan is to continue to fund at 5%, which is the maximum allowed of regional school districts every year. So we are anticipating that the certification, when it comes through, will put the district, it's, it's right at 5%, right just shy of 5%. So, uh, you know, with an operating budget of $45, 46000000 million, you can roughly estimate it's just over 2.2, 2.1, somewhere in that, in that neighborhood that will be certified by you. I have a follow-up if the committee doesn't. Uh, I'm not positive that those who might be watching, you know, the, you know, in general. When we talk about OPEB liability, the post-employment benefits, um, I think a little bit of time in terms of what that recommendation looks like and how the district has performed, right? So the district has put $50,000 in the OPEB uh, trust fund for a considerable amount of time. One of the recommendations at 1% of the general operating budget is a substantial different investment. And so while we haven't chosen to go down that route at this point, it's really important for po folks that are listening understand that that is a sizable jump from the fifty thousand dollars that's there this is not a conversation that is unique to greater new bedford Vote tech this is impacting municipalities and school districts everywhere uh, but i you know i want i appreciate the recommendation right i certainly understand um you know, post-employment benefits is a runaway train in municipal uh, operations, right? And it's also the elephant in the room that school committees, select boards, city councils, and folks don't want to tackle because what it does is takes current dollars and invests them in a sizable fashion towards post-employment benefits. But it's really important for any stakeholder at Greater New Bedford Vote Tech to understand that we've been responsible in trying to address post-employment benefits on the go forward with some contribution. Many districts and school uh, cities and towns address zero or as little as they possibly can to put into that. But I need you to understand that a 1% investment of the district's um, overall funding sources would, would be a sizable increase and would definitely impact operations and the ability to carry forth some of those pieces. So I just want the committee, most importantly, that, that was all about making sure the committee knows that Pam and I are regularly discussing OPEB, E&D, and other fiscal strategies to provide long-term stability to the district but that it's important that we're communicating that out, not only to school committee members, but the public at whole. So I appreciate that recommendation, but I want to make sure that we're clarifying that for those people that are here. Yes. Through you, uh, and Chairman, to the superintendent, that's a sizable difference. What is the difference? So roughly, I'm, I'm doing some quick math in my head, at 47, $47 million budget, 1% is 470000 We're contributing 50, 420 grand. Give yeah, or take. More than we're doing now, right? 420 more than we're doing now. And so when you think about uh, annualized in, you know, increases in Chapter 78 at somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 million, which sounds like an awful lot of money, we talked about that last year, it's not when 700000 goes to COLAs, uh, when 650000 goes to insurance premiums, when investments in programs total 300000 and out of the, that money just quickly evaporates. Uh, so we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we're satisfying what our obligations are to recognizing other post-employment benefits and the cost of that that will impact districts, but we're balancing that with the needs of the operation right now. And I just really wanted to, to give some confidence to the committee and to those people that are watching that we are on top of that uh, here at, at uh, Greater New Bedford Hotel. It somewhat. 
So I think we can, and I think that's a conversation that, that we want to have. I think we also, to be perfectly blunt, uh, I think we also want to measure, and I don't know if this is going to satisfy the auditors, but want to measure our response uh, because this is a runaway trade that's way bigger than us. Um, and at some point, benefits are going to uh, come due, and someone is going to have to pay. Uh, and so I worry sometimes about those that are most prepared will get the least assistance uh, in that bailout, to be perfectly honest, because somebody's coming to pay those benefits, I promise you. Um, I don't know who it's going to be yet, and uh, I think we've lived in, a, in enough to see uh, different governments that are there. So I think we want our response to be measured. Um, so Pam and I will have more conversation about that, and this is really about making sure that you guys have confidence in the fact that we're having those conversations, because there is a benefit to it as well. You heard the AA bond rating. I'd love to see us get to a AAA bond rating, right, which gives us the ability to borrow money at cheaper rates and those kinds of things that are, that are important uh, for school districts. But we've got to measure our response based upon uh, all those daily operations that we face right now. So just that, that's the short answer to that question. Just uh, again, to emphasize what you were saying, I'm just pleased as a committee member that we are putting money in every year. Because as you stated already, Mr. Watson, that there are some places that they don't. You know, people are going to be gone before anything that happens. But I think it's a tribute to this school that that has been something that has been an annual investment. So my hat's off to you, and I agree 100%. That is right now a significant movement towards that way. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Right, and as you pointed out, you're not in the minority if you're not contributing. This is the majority of communities um, aren't, aren't simply able to make the actuarially determined, and I'm not even using that number. Right. Way higher. That's so correct. I'm, Millions. So I'm trying to start, you know, and, and make a recommendation that would help you, but to a smaller extent. Um, I believe that if you were curious, the actuarial number is in the back here. Yeah. And, um, How many million? Number, that number this year would have been 4.8 million. Oh, yeah. So it's just not it's not sustainable to read that. And um, we just looked at the city of New Bedford report. You'd see uh, very large numbers in there as well. So, um, but yes, it is good that you're you're putting something toward it at least. Um, that can be a conversation that you can have. Yeah. It is a conversation that we're having, but just to that point, recognize that an investment of $4.8 million, which is what it would take in order for us to self-fund and to be able to maintain funding at the levels that it already is, not self-fund, uh, is more than twice what we receive in Chapter 70. That would mean no increases in any other cost of doing business across the district. It's unsustainable. And we won't call out other urban districts and New Bedford not being far from the worst. Uh, the bigger the district, the bigger the issue. Uh, that, that these communities are facing. So at some point, someone will step in. Um, and so I think we want to measure our, our response around that. They have to, because the benefits are on a trajectory that's unsustainable. Thank you, and I appreciate the ability to clarify that a little bit. Okay, I'm going to move into the single audit report. Uh, single audit report is required. Anytime federal expenditures for that fiscal year exceed $750,000. You're going to see that there's two letters in the front of this report that we are required to write. Uh, the first letter is going to be the same letter, and that is our, um, what's commonly referred to as the yellow book letter. Uh, that's what the internal control is reporting. So this is more tied into the financial statement itself. It, it is required to be placed in with the single audit if there is a single audit. Uh, and we have no findings in that report. And the second letter that's in that report is the actual single audit required letter that's required by um, uniform guidance, which is set by the federal government. And that report um, discusses the major program that was tested, which this year was the Title One program. In the prior year, it was the Coronavirus Relief Program. And at the bottom of page three, you'll see that our opinion there was in respect to compliance, so there were no findings. This report, along with the financial statement, is filed on what's known as the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, and I believe that has been done uh, to date. If you turn to page five of that report, you'll see the outline of the expenditures <coughs> of federal awards um, for fiscal year 2022. And you can see that um, among the highest programs 
is the Title I program at 778000 Your um, summer food service program for children, which is essentially a school lunch and a school breakfast, was 772000 expenditures for the year. And, uh, you know, continuing down the list, you had the uh, special education program at 536000 in your uh, coronavirus relief again at 573. So uh, the programs are selected based on a rotational basis set by the federal government and also an evaluation of risk by us as the auditors. And this year's program was Title I with no findings. Um, as a result of having no findings for this year and the prior year, um, if you were to page 8, you can see. Um, the very last sentence, it says something along the lines of you qualify as a low risk auditee in the current period under your audit. What that allows us to do as the auditors is rather than test the required 40% coverage for the total federal expense, we can test 20. So as long as there are no findings um, in the report, it actually reduces the audit burden. Um, that's all I got. If there are any questions, I will take I just want to say, you know, because two years in a row, I find it. It's a blessing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to approval of bills, um, warrant 2306. Motion to approve the bill. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Um, Superintendent showed up. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. Uh, this month, again, there's always plenty of people to recognize for their efforts, but I want to single out um, Kim Fortin uh, and her work on the, uh, on the student council. Um, I, th I think she's done a really terrific job in participating um, in all of the events, and Elijah's done a great job talking about them over the, over the fall. But, you know, this plays an important role in changing student culture. Uh, her longtime service in this role is, has been energizing, I think, to folks. I saw her during the Spirit Days, kind of looked up above. She participated in each and every one of those. Um, with Elijah and other folks, they, they've really uh, broadened the scope of student participation, bringing administrators into the conversation. Um, and in my view, really starting to, um, to become part of the life of the school. There's been partnerships with, you know, Mr. Methier and other folks in the Student Activities Division, um, the PR team, and, and promoting things. I mean, it just, the student, the student council has really taken a, a, a pretty lively role in the school. And I just want to take a minute uh, to call Kim out. Uh, she's been the advisor for a long time uh, in this capacity. And um, I think it's important that we recognize folks um, when they're going above and beyond, which she does uh, each and every day here. So uh, this month, she's the, uh, she's the shout out on behalf of, of the administration for her hard work with the student council. Um, moving on to parent communications. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. Um, as always, uh, you have included your POSIP reports. Um, each grade is listed for each of the two sessions that were put uh, forth uh, in December. Parents were uh, surveyed, family engagement has responded to those issues, logs are being kept, uh, Yolanda and the team uh, are regularly following up on this stuff, so uh, just for your perusal to be able to see that the uh, two-way communication process continues to function. Thank you. Principal Rollins, please. Thank you, Dr. Marlin. Happy to showcase our January artisan report. We go into our winter season around here at this wonderful campus. First, I want to talk about our math department. The math department uh, is working diligently with students to address their math skills and remediate skills gaps in the IXL program. Uh, you'll see that we have a chart here that exhibits, once it comes up, the amount of skills that are covered using this IXL platform in our math department. You'll see that over a million questions were answered by our students in this building. 10,000 hours of, of usage of this platform and 10,000 skills mastered across 48,000 skills practice with 37,000 of those kids proficient. So kudos to what they're doing in the math department. 
Um, big shout out to Greg Haley and his team and what he's doing there. Uh, also, we have some very strong professional development going on in the math department. Uh, we had teachers Michaela Shea and Shannon McGuire attend um, a free two-day professional development conference called conference called the Mass MCAS Road Show, uh, put on by Texas Instrument that took place in September and the following will be in February. Uh, this, the goal of this is to really strengthen our math strategies courses and enhance our students' uh, abilities on the MCAS tests in math. Also, we had teachers Shannon McGuire and Bridget Taylor attend a Mass Q fall conference, a very well-known fall conference, at the Gillette Stadium. Uh, the mission that Mass Q has, which is the Mass Computer Using Educators, is to educate, connect, and inspire the educational community by providing high-quality professional learning, leveraging knowledge and expertise, recognizing innovation, excellence and courage, and advocating for strategic policies and programs. Um, and I just want to mention the four staff members, that, uh, the three that I mentioned, Bridget, Michaela, and Shannon, do a lot to help out with the professional development that we have for our staff in the building as well. So amazing work on their part. They're always looking to improve so that they can improve their instruction for our students. Um, MCAS math retest, that is, um, a poll. so that was taken in November. Uh, 23 students completed the MCAS retest. Special thanks to Sue DeMurray, as always, for the work she does around MCAS. Special thanks to the folks in the uh, math department, Jay Pacheco, Eloisa Gabush, Alexis Bates, uh, Erica Gomes, Monica Richard, and Bonnie Shelton for their efforts in getting our students retested in math. I'm hopeful that those students will do great on that retest. Now on to our illustrious social studies department, led by Brian Patnock. You'll see that our uh, students in U.S. history are creating infographics. The topics covered in History 1 for those infographics, you'll see social reforms, the abolition movement, prisons, asylums, and education. Being a history major, I can appreciate this, and I can remember having this for studying prisons. So. Uh, great work that they're doing. Uh, additionally, they're looking at the suffrage movement, mental health reform, temperance, and the influence of trans transcendentalist writers in the uh, U.S. history or in the history department. We're going to move on to Academy C now, the Consumer Services Information and Transportation Department. So the Automotive Technology Shop currently has six students out on co-op at various area dealerships. Uh, with that number expected to grow by the end of the school year. Amazing work. First round of juniors have finished job placement rotation with the second round to start in cycle 15. The experience provides students an inside look at what it's really like to work at major dealerships such as Alden Buick of Fairhaven, Empire Ford of New Bedford, Toyota, Toyota, Colonial Dodge, and Kia of Dartmouth. Um, students are preparing for this year's Skills USA competition, competition as well. Business technology, we'll move on to that shop. So the holiday season was a great success at the Den, as always. You see that throughout New Bedford, Dartmouth, and Fairhaven. If you're shopping at Market Basket or wherever you are, you're going to see Bolt Tech apparel. There's apparel everywhere. And so our Den is, is really strong, and I love seeing our students with Ms. Ripley every day uh, coordinating the Den and, and selling our wonderful apparel. The business technology students worked hard to prepare, prepare extended hours over the holidays, uh, and they're just doing great work. Additionally, though, by the end of the school year, seniors will have a professional business plan and portfolio ready to be submitted to, to investors. We look forward to watching their ideas manifest. The great work in the business technology shop. Additionally, certifications um, that our students are working on are the Microsoft Office suite programs, and our students are preparing for the state leadership conference, the EPA, coming. And I'll move on to collision technology. Approximately 50% of the senior class is on co-op, which is amazing. Adriano Badillo, Noah Thomas, Axel Cruz, Mariah Cruz, Eamon Perry, Cassidy Souza. Uh, in places like Hathaway <coughs> Center, Tech Garage and Auto Body, APC Auto Body, Artistic Body, and excellent work on their part. The following juniors are heading to the local Skills USA competition uh, at O'Leary. Isaiah Houtman, Dylan Bagley, Diesel Leaguer, Larry Santos, Mariah Cruz, and Alexander Bergeron. Let's wish them the best of luck in their competition. We'll move on to our 
Cosmetology. Cosmetology has been hard at work in their new salon, the Salon 20. By the way, I did get my, my clear coat. Hope you don't judge me on that. So they do a good job over there. I got my, my nails done and my locks done. I had to try it. Um, you know, they've been working hard at, at the Salon 20. Uh, great work by our IT department and our facilities department getting that job completed for our students. It's beautiful in there. If you haven't gone in, go check it out. Open house in the holiday season saw a lot of movement in that shop. Many people from the, the community coming in to get their nails done, hair done. People from our building going in there to get their nails done, hair done. And it's such an amazing shop that uh, Pete Braley from Educational Access called into the shop with his story. He did an expose for the Classroom Chronicles show. Um, and the, and so it was about the Salon 20 and also the overall cause of the program. So check that out in the Bedford Educational Access. We'll move, skip that. we'll move on to the Information Technology Shop. Uh, we saw Ms. Harrison, Susan Harrison, here uh, at the last meeting uh, talking about the Costa Rica trip. She's actually a brand new teacher to our school. She joined as our new Information Technology Related Teacher for Programming, Web Design, and Information Support Services. She comes to us from Plymouth North High School and has been teaching for 26 years, bringing a wealth of knowledge to the program. She's an avid sports enthusiast and was a varsity softball coach at Plymouth North. Glad to have her on board. Slide. Here we have Toby Sinar. He's also an ISSN shop uh, student. Um, Toby is taking the lead on creating a high availability cluster using VMware. VSphere, which team up all three servers to optimize performance, uptime, and reliability. Elijah, if you wouldn't mind just translating that for me. <laughs> um, the inf uh, so great job, this young man, Toby Steinar. Uh, the shop in generally, the information support services and networking program has recently purchased three Dell PowerEdge R350 servers, and our kids are at work, um, you know, working hard and, and doing the best with their equipment. That, that new equipment. Its uninterruptible power supplies have been installed to protect the classroom's data center from power fluctuations that mirror industry standards. And the department wants to give a huge shout out to yours truly, Pam Stewart, in the business office who helped navigate through the many supply chain issues uh, of obtaining uh, these, these supplies. We move on now to our marine technology shop that's burgeoning, but it's doing a great job. Work is planned with the Community Boating Center to certify our freshman class in safe power boat handling in the United States Coast Guard. <clears throat> Currently, Marine Tech is restoring a fleet of six 9 feet by 13 feet Boston whalers, originally designed by a gentleman from New Bedford, D. Raymond Hunt. Um, the boats are used for safety training, coaching, and umpire launches. The launches will be used in spring on NBRC's 1500 meter race course. Uh, located a short distance from Boat Tech on the Upper Virginia <coughs> River. Awesome stuff. On the next slide, we'll see four youngsters who are participating in placement at East Coast Interiors, Marine, Rick's Outboard Marine, and Community Boating Center. We have Zachary Lake from left to right, Braden Duart, Jordan Mello, Aiden Williams, and Jordan, I will mention, is a very esteemed um, officer of uh, Skills USA program. Great work to our Marine Tech program in its third year. I like to see it grow and keep doing great things for our community. Academy D. We have, led by our newest administrator, uh, Jeffrey Wilder, who's doing a great job acclimating to the role. Architectural and uh, mechanical design is the shop I'd like to first talk about in that department. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry, that's Beverly Rebella, who's also in her first year. doing a great year, job, too. Doing an amazing job as well. Um, sorry about that. Architectural Mechanical Design, senior students and their instructor, uh, Mr. Bernardo, are continuing their work designing the new maintenance and athletic shed in conjunction with the carpentry department. It's looking beautiful out there on the Jeffrey Riley Field. All our students are working at Horatio's and GCD, consulting engineers, and have received loan review from their employers. Um, in the engineering and robotics shop, um, Field USA advisor Anthony Cabral, who's also a teacher in that shop, has 12 students um, who will be competing in the upcoming Skills USA competition, eight of whom will be competing in the urban search and rescue competition 
four who will be competing in the robotic arm competition. Um, that's up at states. If you ever had the opportunity to go up in there, go to states and see the competition. It's beautiful. It's amazing. You see our kids at their very best. And that's one of the best. Um, robotics and engineering is one of the best things to watch. I can tell you right now. Machine technology will move on to. We have a brand new teacher in machine technology who is an alumni uh, from New Bedford Volk Tech, Esteban, Mr. Esteban Rodriguez. Uh, he spent 16 years in the field, in the machine tech field as a machinist, and he's very familiar with the machines. And growing up in New Bedford, is very familiar with our students, so we're very happy to have him. Um, also, like to mention about our students, we have four out of ten seniors who are enrolled in co-op at this time. To move on to media technology. So the media technology seniors are working on the faces of New Bedford Volk Tech. You'll see that billboard just outside of the coffee shop. Uh, this project involves interviewing various staff members and students about their experiences at Greater New Bedford Folk Tech, which is awesome. Uh, it's a cross section of, of teachers and staff and students that are selected for this project. This is done as a part of the media writing course and use interviewing, writing, and photography skills. I had the pleasure of being one of the faces of Volk Tech last year. It's pretty awesome. And the kids do a great job with it. Uh, we'll move on to Metal Fab and Joining. Uh, we have a brand new teacher there as well that I was happy to hire, um, who is also an alumni from 2009, Mr. Joe Gonzalez, uh, who has also spent time in the field for a number of years and also is a teacher um, in the welding program for our GNBBTI. GNBBTI program. I'd like to mention that we have nine out of 13 seniors that are involved with in the co-op program, working at places such as East Coast Fabrication, DW White, um, Fairhaven Shipyard, Dartmouth Awning, and Technicor. Um, and we also have Skills USA Weld uh, students, eight students that will compete in Skills USA Welding Sculpture and Welding Competitions this spring. We'll now talk about our stationary engineering program. We've got to learn a little bit about supply chain disruptions and we all have to try and overcome. As part of ESSER grant funds, uh, grant ventilation upgrades, Greater Bedford Folk Tech recently made the decision to fully rebuild the school's chill water pumps, which is an amazing thing to take a look at someday if you do a tour of the school. A stationary program <coughs> in collaboration with students from electrical and welding departments um, to <coughs> this project go worked with them to see this project through. And you can see sort of a timeline of that gap in waiting on the materials in which we had to rent you know, water pumps for some time before they can actually be installed. So um, that's the nature of the beast at this moment. We had the same issues when uh, putting together our cosmetology shop. or <coughs> Next slide, our stationary engineering students had the awesome opportunity of hearing from a uh, graduate, uh, Jack Knowles, some time out of his work at um, basically at being a student at Mass Maritime Academy to speak with students. He graduated um, his Mass second class fireman's license and was accepted into the facility engineering program at MMA. Students were lucky enough to hear him speak and you see him in the bottom picture. It's really awesome it's to, to see the product of what Volt Tech does for them. We will talk about our vision design, visual design program. We have sophomore Ariana Lopes, who's, who was featured in the South Coast today. Um, great smile there. She's an awesome kid. Uh, she is an entrepreneur, an artist launching her own business, unique sketches. She designs and sells prints of her original digital artwork, adding pink shirts to her offerings. Big congratulations to Ariana for the work that she does. Talk about our guidance department at this time. Some upcoming events. Shop selections are upon us. Forms will be distributed to freshmen at the end of this month. We'll be making that fateful, those fateful decisions. Also, shop, pl and, and shop placements essentially will take place January 30th. So this month we'll move with the selections and those placements. Uh, BCC will be here uh, for a BCC Palooza on-site admissions for our students to enroll if, if they are interested. Uh, they'll be here on Valentine's Day. Uh, those are some good opportunities for our students. Co-op. Great work done by our new co-op director, Henry DeGrace. Uh, he says, thanks to the co-op um, instructors and students uh, for, role, for uh, starting 
to roll like thunder, as they have been doing. And you see by the data, to date, over 200 students, which is 42% of our senior class, um, are out on over 200, uh, over 100 sites across the state, which is really amazing. And they've amassed over $538,000, which they've been paid to date. It's pretty amazing. So it pays to be out on co-op, that's for sure. Um, right now, Mr. DeGrace is working on a partnership with Master Millworks, who wants to employ some of our students. And we are very excited that uh, a number of our students will be working at East Coast Fabrication. That is amazing. Um, you'll see in the next slide we have Dylan Kajuda, who is out at Joseph Abood. You can see that he's actually Joseph Abood, and he's doing live work there. Really amazing. He's responsible for a lot of the boiler information, testing for the water, and upkeep at the boiler room, and machinery in the factory. Really proud of his work. You see on the next slide, you've got Brady Kruger and Devin Perez. We're working at Primo Medical. They're working along seasoned employees, showing that they are vital, that they are vital part of the team. The machinery that they're working on actually is the same machinery that we have in our machine technology shop. So it goes just goes to show that we our program is truly aligned with what's out there in the field. With that, I conclude our artisan report. Thank you for listening. I just want to say one thing about the, the co-op program. I had to go to the, um, the uh, walk-in clinic, uh, the South Coast walk-in clinic on Mill Road last night. And um, I was attended to by a young lady who took all my information, checked all my vitals, and actually did an EKG on me. I asked her if she's presently going to school for this. I thought she was a nursing student somewhere. See, I'm a senior at Great Independent Folk. <laughs> and I'm very good friends with Elijah Gonzalez. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> dropping. I, I can't <laughs> yeah, better care, Elijah. He's working hard on this. I can't remember her name, Elijah. <laughs> she was on the student council with you. Oh, man. Oh, Linda. Was it Olinda? Oh, Olinda. Oh, That's it. Oh, oh, <laughs> you've done a fantastic job. I was so proud of it. I could have popped. I said, this is so great. Yeah, that's really awesome, Mr. Durgan. And just to add to uh, the co-op piece, uh, just as an appreciation of the, of the 200 students that are out there, we set, in my view, a pretty ambitious uh, goal in August, which was 210 kids. Uh, that was more than 10% what we saw last year in 188, uh, which was more than 15% what we saw in 140 kids. And we've tracked the co-op number, uh, numbers for the last decade. So, when, not if anymore, but when we cross 210 kids on co-op, that will be more than 30% more than what we did in any of the prior eight years before last year at 188. So uh, it's underscoring the fact that when we say good job, it's not good, it's a great job. And the fact that not nearly 50% of seniors are out in the fields working, working in placement centers, described by Mr. Durgan and many other kids, is a testament to not only Henry, to vocational educators and kids uh, in, in the work that we do here every day. And so I just want to make sure that we're not, we're not missing that moment in, in the context of so many great things that Mr. Williams described uh, for us. It's a really exciting, and I'll make sure uh, to see Mr. DeGrace and to celebrate that when that 210th kid uh, is put out on, on co-op and we cross 50%, because uh, we're closing in on that number, and he deserves recognition for his efforts to make that happen. So thank you. One more thing. Um, my neighbor, young Calvin Dobson, is a two, 2020 graduate of engineering, and he's presently a junior at uh, Wentworth. He's being sent out on co-op to the same exact place in Taunton that we sent him to on co-op. So isn't that awesome. interesting? Yeah. Awesome. We won't even have to train him. Chair? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. Just a couple of things. I, my first list I started when I looked at this yesterday was, very lengthy, but I'm going to be very short on it because there was a lot of information. Again, you did a well, good job. It's nice to see that this school, because talking to other administrators, you no, know, they're not sending out people as much because they got to keep them in with kids. But having our staff, especially in the math area, to go out and gather information and bring it back, I think is a must to stay on top of what is happening. You wait two years and then all of a sudden you lose things. So I like that. You know, social studies. Infographics, I mean, you think of U.S. history, you think of general stuff that are uh, the Civil War, the histories of, of, to see what they're doing up there on the infographics was, was really interesting. And, and I think it's, 
here we are in 2023. So again, my hat's off to hearing that. The career areas where a lot of them here are always interested to hear with the updates. So keep them going. I think you know you got people here that are very interested in finding out because you know we don't hear them enough. So thank you for letting us know on that. Um, two other comments. Uh, Salon 20. What, why the name 20? Is there a reason there? There must be a reason. I have not I asked named it in 20. And then they no. didn't change the name when they. Okay. Were, I said that. It bugged me last night. I said, yeah, 20. What? what, what? <laughs> uh, 20 kids in the class? 20? Okay. It just it goes with it. All right. Yeah. 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 Uh, Marine Technology would be interested at the end of the year to hear reports because that's a new shop. So I'd like to hear, keep going. But that's an interesting one that I, I hope to get off the ground. The last thing I'll just end here with my notes because I, I think it was, uh, you know, one of my favorite things that I, I read during the uh, um, when you get the information is that these new teachers are coming in. I think I mentioned one other time. You know, even if it's during the year, if the summer starts in February, it would be nice to have them come to that first meeting that they're part because I think, you know, we all would like to welcome them, you know, in. And it's very hard to start at the beginning of the year. It's super hard to start throughout the year coming in when everything's established. So. Um, I'm glad that you give us the names, but we nice to put a name in their face with all these new people that's happening. So, just a comment. Yeah. So, Mrs. Fredette, we'll make a note of that. Um, yeah, I agree. And it's, uh, we got a lot of people that have been retiring. Uh, not, not many that have left the district, but uh, when I tell you there's been a lot of new faces in the last uh, 18 months, uh, we're close to 70 when you count cafeteria aides and teaching assistants and folks like that. So. Uh, yeah, it's, there's a lot of new faces, and so I appreciate Mr. Shea's comments, and I think that we, uh, you know, we can make a note of that and maybe bring those folks at some point, or at least offer the opportunity for those folks to come and just introduce themselves to you and what they do uh, as part of Greater New Bedford Vote Tech. So I think that's a really awesome yeah, suggestion. Yeah, we walk the corridors sometimes. It'd be awful yeah. nice to, like I said, walk down and like, yeah, don't know anybody yeah. anymore. So just, just a suggestion. Move on. Superintendent's oh. waiting. He wants, he's waiting to speak again. Is it me again? Yeah. Superintendent's <laughs> weekly updates. Okay, yes. Uh, so in your packet are the letters that are sent every Monday to staff. I just want to highlight a couple of quick things for you uh, from the December 12th letter. As you know, uh, very soon we will be moving the uh, health department, health nursing offices to the old fashion design space on a temporary basis. By, by the middle of March, that construction will begin. That is a nearly $2 million renovation to the health center, completely funded uh, through the federal ESSA three relief. So that process will begin in March and conclude before the opening of the 23-24 uh, school year. That was one thing we referenced a few weeks ago. Right before the vacation and then right after, we referenced the new Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Council that will be chaired by Yolanda Dennis. Uh, we described that in one of the newsletters. We sent out the form for interested staff members and community members who wish to serve on that committee. Yolanda is collecting uh, interested parties' information. We'll be reviewing that at some point in the middle of next week with the hope of lifting that off uh, probably next month. Uh, the final thing that I wanted to mention, well, the final two things, is we're going to begin work later this month on the Strategy for District Improvement Committee. There are more than 25 folks that will be part of a team. Uh, that are going to start to look at my entry report from last year and turn that into a strategy for district improvement, which will ultimately lead to the district improvement plan for the district. You'll be updated and see a copy of that report in the spring when that work is completed. We'll be beginning that later this month. And finally, uh, a special thanks, as I've been mentioning all along, to the uh, grant writing team and teams uh, that have put before us. Since July 1st, we've uh, amassed more than $2.5 million in capital grants to renovate programs. Um, at the school, and so I'm really proud of their efforts, and I've been trying to highlight that uh, in the weekly newsletters as well, just to give you folks and the community at large uh, some some work, some emphasis on the work that we're doing day in day out here. In addition to the great structural things that are happening every day. Thank you. Thank you. Now for Mr. Gonzalez. All right. Happy New Year. 
So last month, um, there were some things that happened in the student body that I'd like to share. So last month, the students took part in the talent show. So there were dance performances, they were singing, um, there was a magician, a magician there, and um, there were a few people who, um, it wasn't on my nose, it was on top of my tongue. There was a few <laughs> people who, um, you know, there was a lot of talent at that night. <laughs> there was a lot of talent, there was a lot of talent, but kids showed up, they uh, performed, had a lot, of, um, a lot of confidence, and it was a great night, there was a great turnout. Um, in March, GMB, Huh? Yeah, me and Coral, Coral Madeira, she's a student in Legal Protective Services. We hosted the night. It was fun. Um, yeah, it was, it was a fun experience. Like, if you was there, you knew that it was cool. You know what I mean? Um, for sure. So, um, this coming up March, the GMBBT will be having another school pep rally. So, the student council is already planning this event and will be meeting this Thursday to talk about what we want to see at this pep rally. And the goal of this pep rally is to re spark some school spirit. Um, I also want to highlight the Bears Building Community Club. So the Bears Building Community Club will be holding a winter drive from January 9th to 20th to support our community. So we will be collecting new or gently used winter hats, gloves, scarves, and sweatshirts. So all donations will help those in need. So if you want to donate, you can just go by the Welcome Center, drop off a bag of clothes. Um, but thank you for your support. Um, it's awesome where students come together and we support our community. Come on, that's what it's about. So um, I also want to highlight BPA. So BPA right now, the students will be selling candy to fundraise for their trip to the National Leadership Conference. So support the students of BPA by putting in a, a candy order before you leave today. I have some forms if you want to put in an order. $2 a candy bar, come on. You don't get better than that. TBS is $3 for a Kit Kat, but $2, come on. Um, hey, so I have some forms if you want to stop by later. So the National Honor Society. So the officers in the National Honor Society have been working together to create a sign-up form for juniors who are interested in signing up for officers. So that form will be going out next week um, to the juniors, and um, the officer team will be meeting on the last day of January, which is the 31st. Also, Mr. Vogue Tech is coming up. So the date for this event is March 24th, and Mr. Vogue Tech is a show that fundraises for um, the seniors after prom. So come out March 24th, it's going to be a great night. And like I said, the student council will be meeting this Thursday at 2.30 in room 251, which is Mrs. Fortin's room. And shout out to her, I want to build off of Mr. Watson. She's a great teacher, great leader, and um, not only does she do student council, she also teaches AP European History, which I'm in right now. And it's a hard class, believe me, it's a hard class, but she makes it enjoyable, she makes it fun, and she makes it really down to earth. So we appreciate Ms. Fortin a lot. Um, and the senior prom. So the seniors will be having their prom on May 25th. It will be heading to after prom the day after May 26th. And after prom is a free event in which students um, do not need to attend prom to go. And um, also, I have a question for the board, if I may ask the chair. So I remember at a last meeting, there was um, talk about a student's activities balance that wasn't um, claimed by any club or activity. And I was wondering if the school committee had found a way to distribute those funds to the clubs at our school. Yeah. Yeah. The um, miscellaneous funds were all transferred to each floor of the classes, so everyone received the same dollar amount. And if you give me one moment, I can tell you exactly what was deposited into the group. I wanted all in your group, and then you were back. After share, be equitable. So share the class clear. of 2023 now has a balance of $16,720.60. Um, each class received five thousand two hundred forty-one dollars and ninety-eight cents. Oh, that nice? So five thousand two forty-one point ninety-eight. So the class of twenty-three again has sixteen thousand seven hundred and twenty dollars and sixty cents. The class of twenty-four has thirteen thousand five hundred twenty-three dollars and thirty-five cents. The class of twenty-five has seven thousand four hundred forty-four dollars and nineteen cents. And the class of twenty-six has $5,242.52. Running stop for the class of 2026. Thank you. And that concludes my uh, student report. Thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
right, we're moving on to new business, please. Um, vote to approve the out of state travel for student athletes. Second. Um, vote to approve 2022 annual report. Second. All in favor? Vote to accept the donation made by Royce Ratner in your backup material. We'll move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, vote to designate a surplus recommendation uh, district committee vote to designate a surplus. Second. Yeah. All in favor? SMEC annual report and audit. Yeah, it's in the packet. Yep, it's in the packet. Okay. Um, communication to uh, Northern Machinery Sales on January 6th. It's on file. It's on file. Um, Thank you. To um, uh, yes. uh, Mr. Watson, I know we received information tonight about the trip to the <coughs> yep. Is that something that we should talk about now? Or, or because I know last month yep. they wanted us to think about it. Okay. So, so if I, is it okay to talk? Okay. Yeah, so it's not on the agenda for, for an official vote, but you guys are free to have that conversation. Okay. We, uh, I talked with Dr. Mowen over the weekend when the information became available, um, and we decided to copy it all for you folks. We had a conversation about that, and, um, you know, you folks are free to, to take action and decide um, as you wish. Uh, we will be placing it on the February agenda. Uh, now that information is there, so you have time to digest that, but, you know, far be it from me to... Uh, Committee wishes to talk about. I want to mention my, my, I wasn't sure if I was going in that direction. I had questions. Um, since then, I, I know my granddaughter signed up for Europe, you know, for Bethel High School moving forward. I, I, I was asking questions, and one of the questions I asked the instructor was about the liability we had. And she did email me the next day, uh, two days later. Saying that you know the school is not held liable because it's a parent's decision to go. We're all we're saying is to move forward. Um, but anything happens, you know, they take full responsibility of everything. And so I I'm just letting others know where I stand because I think it's you know it, I think it's a great thing. I, I I was hesitant, but we have a couple people that are willing to take kids to a trip and. And their time and effort and working. So I'm, I'm a supporter of this. And again, it's not because of what's going to happen to the school. I feel confident enough that we're not people doing it. All we're saying is that it's a parent's decision to send their child. And as a committee member, I'm going, I'm going to support it on the vote whenever the vote is. All right. Thank you. So I think just to ride on that, though, in, in why are we sanctioning a trip? Um, if the school committee is being asked to authorize it, then there must be some liability tagged to it. Um, uh, I am writing that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be asked. The, the waiver there to sign, but no, when they meet the parents, I mean, it's all in there that it basically through the organization. And I, we we're sanctioning it to the point of that they have. If we said to me that the history club would like to take everyone to Europe. You know, that's a school activity that we're representing. The way I understand this, and this is what other schools have been doing for years, is that 
you know, they are just offering it, and, and we're, we're okaying the two teachers to move forward in meeting, using this place as a site, sign up. But again, the parents are the ones that are, are determining if that child should or should not go, not us. So that's how I read it. So I, but the, we were told, I was Sue. Yeah, yeah, Sue and, and Mr. Shepard. So when we got the information over the weekend, and I immediately passed it on to Dr. Marley, we had this conversation, and the general feel was we would provide it to the committee uh, to review, but I think this is a perfect example of why we want to make sure that everybody's comfortable, right? So I am happy to run down, I appreciate Mr. Shea's comments, first and foremost, I think everyone agrees it's an outstanding opportunity for kids. Sensitive to Mr. Olivera's mm -hmm. comments as well, and I am happy to run down any questions at any point this month to get an answer so that we're not uh, the delay. And that's what I communicated to Mr. Shepard is that I don't want the committee or the administration to be uh, you know, delaying the process, right? When we get the information, which we now have, I think it's prudent for us to, to make a decision. It's also prudent for me to make sure that each and every one of your questions are answered. Um, I can tell you that any time with athletics on the regular, that students leave the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a school committee vote is required. Uh, this, of course, is not going to Rhode Island. This is going uh, to another country. And that is the reason why you're being asked. I will get an answer on the liability that's exposed to the district with one of those tri uh, trips, if any, uh, and be able to report that back to you. And I can just re read your word for it. That way, the, please, I don't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sue Harrison, I checked with EF Educational Tours regarding your question. If your student were to get hurt in Costa Rica and the school would be liable. The answer I received was that all travelers sign a release form that releases a school district and any school employees from liability. That again, now maybe our attorney should take I think that just review it. I think it just makes it. sense. Yeah. But that was something that again, the release is, is there. So that's why I'm supporting it. School districts are definitely doing, you know, through EF. So, uh, but I, I think it's a great question and worthy of us just making sure. Of. And I just want to say it's not that they object to the trip. I just feel. Number one, uncomfortable with the liability exposure, and number two, going to Costa Rica, I mean, isn't one of the, the most stable parts of the world. Um, you know, look what's happened in Brazil and obviously throughout the world. Um, and, you know, sending a group of kids sanctioned by the school committee, I just think we need some more answers before I feel comfortable. I'm not where Mike feels, I'm not where Mike is right now. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll get there. I, I, just, I just don't have that comfort level just yet. So, you know, I, I think there's some more answers we need. Yeah. Um, hopefully, it, you know, it is that particular case where, um, you know, the parents make the decision. If they feel comfortable sending their kids to a, you know, to that region, then um, so be it. But well, definitely needs more discussion. I, I agree with uh, Mike. I think it's an awesome opportunity to see the parents. I also understand the I think just giving us a, a, a attorney or whatever, a, a real so co concrete answer to that would make everybody more comfortable. Other than that, I have no problem whatsoever. This, these trips happen all, in every school system all over the country. I got my, my niece is going to the uh, Colacos in June with her school. So they, these, these trips happen every, every day throughout the, the country. Other questions on that? Elijah, what do you think as a student? Man, I mean, so last year I got to travel to Texas for a BPA competition, National Leadership Conference, and I think what I really loved about it was I got to see, because me, so, I've, tra I've been traveling outside of the country before, right? But all my life I've pretty much been in Massachusetts. I've been to Disney before, I've been to a lot of states, right? But I never like went with my friends and like as like a school. And I think what that really brought me was an opportunity to see how other students, how other students were like were like at, with their schools in the community. I think my favorite part about going to Texas was just meeting different people. And different people from different backgrounds. Like I met a kid, right, who's a part of FFA, Future Farmers of America. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> like Future Farmers of America. You know, I, I can't, I have, listen, man, come on. Like, I just, I think it's a really great op opportunity to network with other people and just to experience different people. 
Like, yeah, like, be, like I'm still I'm like, that. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> no one knew what coffee milk was, but I think that it took like that level of my brain to be like, man, like I'm not like, like, my for my brain to be like, man, like there's di there's different things in the world that people are a part of. I think that's what kind of like shocked me, and I think it's a great opportunity to see what the world is like, see what people how people are living in Costa Rica. Um, it's a great opportunity, and I think like safety is a big concern, right? Don't get me wrong, but it's like um. Sometimes you're gonna sign up for things that aren't 100% safe. I think it takes a lot of um, telling students, like, okay, we need to make sure that we're doing this. Well, in this area, you gotta make sure that, you know what I mean, like, just get accustomed to the culture there. But I feel like if we prepare, if we teach students some safety measures to take while they're in Costa Rica, I feel like it could be a successful trip, honestly. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Pledger, just we're going to look into this and then we'll put on the next month. We'll put on next month, but again, maybe get an answer from our attorney, but uh, even call that EF company and, and hear it. Okay, any other business folks? Um, so now we're going to be going into executive session, chapter 30, section 21. <laughs> Um, and adjourning to this uh, executive session, we will discuss a strategy to um, to negotiations in union and non-union personnel. And as the chair, I have determined that uh, this open meeting is detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee. Therefore, members will not be returning to this session. We'll also be, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, discussing strategy related to ongoing litigation. Mr. Shea? Yes. Mr. Barrow? Yes. Ms. Oliveira? Yes. Mr. Durgan? Yes. Mr. Yes. Dr. Marlin? Yes. Thanks.